Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, but you kind of knew it, didn't you? You knew. Eh. Hey, it's a great day to be alive. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Whatever you're doing, whether you're out there uh, walking the dogs, driving carpool, driving to work after carpool, glad you're with us. Glad you've taken a few minutes to listen to some people who have some interesting perspectives on money and happiness. And today, I got a good one. He's from the Harvard Business School. His name is Mike Norton. He's a professor there. He is also the co-author of the book, Happy Money, The Science of Happier Spending, that I'm going to tell you all about in just a moment. Before I do, I want to ask your help. I want you to help me tell the world that this podcast means something to a lot of people. So if you could, take just a moment to scroll down to the bottom of that podcast app, if you're listening on iTunes, and take a moment to rate and review this podcast. Please also take a moment to subscribe to the podcast so that next week's episode shows up automatically in your podcast library there on your phone. If you're listening to me on Spotify and or Pandora, hello, you are obviously a person of great taste and discernment because those are wonderful platforms. Please take a moment to follow the podcast, and uh, likewise, they'll see that people out there love crazy money, and I appreciate it. So I've been on a journey for the past four years. I've been reading everything I can get my hands on that relates to money and happiness, and I've done this as part of the preparation to start writing the book that I'm almost done with. I know I keep threatening you with that book, but I swear, almost done. The process of writing that book has led me to create crazy money. And so I literally am always seeking out new books that I have missed, right? Like, so the ones that are easy to find or kind of hit your radar early, but I'll Google money books or happiness books or money and philosophy and money and religion. And I found a lot of cool stuff. Like tomorrow, for example, I'm going to be interviewing a professor from London Business School who wrote a book all about money and what the Buddhists can teach us about that. And I found it to be highly, highly interesting, and I can't wait for our conversation, which I'll be sharing with you in two or three weeks. But one of the first books you'll run across when you dive into this world of money and happiness is the book that is co-authored by Mike Norton, our guest today. It's called Happy Money, The Science of Happier Spending, as I said once before, and we'll say one more time before we're done this introduction. He co-authored it with Elizabeth Dunn from the University of British Columbia. And he, as I mentioned, is at Harvard Business School. So when you start studying money and happiness, one of the themes that presents itself early and often, is that we humans, all of us, we are not good at predicting what will make us happy. And whether it's a job or a relationship or how we spend our money, we fall into a lot of pitfalls of our glitchy brain software. In other words, we see something that somebody else has and we think to ourselves, boy, if I just had that, then I'd feel complete and then I'd be worthy of love. Sorry, did I say that out loud? I said it out loud, but you know what I mean. You know exactly what I mean. We make an assumption that buying stuff will make us feel powerful. It will make us feel alive and that the status that those acquired materialistic goods and or outward signs of success, those things will lead us to greater happiness. And past a certain point, past a certain point of, uh, you know, paying your rent and having enough food on the table, that just certainly isn't true. And Mike's going to tell us all about some of the things that their real research around how spending can make us happier if we do it in certain ways. It's all pretty intuitive when you think about it, but it's not how we operate. And so I think you'll find his insights to be worthy of your time. Let's say that we're certainly worthy of your time and hopefully will make you just a slightly bit more thoughtful about the way your money and the way you spend it can make you a happier individual. One of the things And it's a short interview, so this introduction is going to be a little longer than usual. So sorry, bear with me. I'm going to do my best to make it entertaining. So one of the things that he recommends that we do to be more mindful about the way we spend our money is to go back to make a note next to every entry on your credit card statement as to whether or not it made you happy. Pretty interesting exercise, right? And I'm going to do mine in a second. But before I do that, I wanted to start thinking out loud about what are some of the best purchases that I've made in my life? Like, what were the purchases that made me the happiest? Have I talked about my Saturn SL2, my 1994 Saturn SL2 that I bought for $13,000 in a no haggle transaction with a man with a John Stossel mustache in uh, 1995? The Saturn SL2, ladies and gentlemen, is a tin can on wheels with a moped engine. 
it was perhaps the least sexy car ever built. And yet when I think about all the cars I've bought in the 25 years since then, no purchase has made me happier than this. And this is because prior to driving the 1994 Saturn SL2, which is previously mentioned as a tin can on wheels, that car started reliably and had air conditioning. And while living in Memphis, Tennessee in August, if your car doesn't have air conditioning, you're not a happy person. Going from no air conditioning and a ton of pain to some air conditioning was this giant relief. Also, it started when I needed it to start, which uh, if you've ever had a car that's super unreliable, boy, is that a stressful thing in your life. So that might be my favorite purchase ever. And I've bought some nice cars since then, but the Saturn SL2, that was, that was a good one. Here's some other things that make me happy purchase-wise. Roku. I like Roku. We just cut the cord here at the Ollinger House in an effort to save money. Not sure we actually have, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but I like Roku. I like its interface. I like that it helps me find the content that I'm looking for, and it's got like a cool fish tank vibe as their screensaver that's pretty fun. I got a black Patagonia jacket that I like. I like that a lot. They're not cheap, but I wear it all the time. And when I think about satisfaction with purchases, I think I come back to where's the value? What did I get the best value out of? Which of those things that I've bought, especially when it comes to clothes, like which do I think is an accurate representation of my taste and who I am? The Patagonia jacket, very comfortable, very simple, stylish-ish, yeah, as practical as it is stylish. Patagonia, Patagucci, nice brand. I like that. Also, I love Spotify. I like that whatever I, 15 bucks a month for Spotify, that's like one CD, $15 on a CD. How many times could you listen to that CD? I buy one CD every month and I get to listen to all the music in the world. That's pretty awesome. Oh, I dig that. Purchase I regret. The number one purchase I regret in my life is uh, this watch I bought. I have a couple of nice watches and I bought a third one that was like way more expensive than the others. And the first time I wore it, I was looking at it going like, why don't I feel cooler about having this watch on my wrist? And I realized it was like, I'm trying too hard. I'm trying too hard. I'm, I'm buying this to impress other people. I'm buying it to impress myself. And I just didn't, didn't need it, didn't want it. So anyway, the watch, that was a big expensive watch. Maybe the first watch I got, I, I remember buying those and thinking those were really cool and it was a symbol of having made it. But once you get to a certain point, none of that shit matters, man. All right, now I'm looking at my credit card statement. I'm gonna go down the list here, some of the things that I've bought. Fandango, $31 and AMC Theater, 12 bucks. Yeah, I took my daughter to see Frozen 2 yesterday for her birthday. Didn't love the movie. Sorry, Bob Iger but I did love being with my girl. Okay, we're going to call that money well spent. Party City decorations for the young lady's birthday party. Yeah, that was a win, even though all that shit's in the trash right now. Uber Eats had some friends over Saturday night. It was rainy outside. Instead of going out, we uh, stayed in, had a fire, did a little hooga-ing, hooga look. If you don't remember what that is, go back and listen to the episode with Mike Viking from Copenhagen, Denmark. Had some hooga. That was worth it. Public Supermarket. Well, yeah, I like to eat. I like to be able to feed my children. That's money well spent. Audible.com, $15. Yeah, I like content. I guess that's what I'm hearing myself say. I, I was just talking about how much I like Spotify, how much I like Roku. Like the Audible, 15 bucks a month. Wish it was a little cheaper, but what, what are you going to do? On the topic of content, Google YouTube TV, paying 60 bucks a month. Like the interface. Pretty good product as long as the home Wi-Fi is working well. I dig Google and YouTube TV. Here's my beef with all this new, the over-the-top apps. We subscribe now to Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, HBO Go, Showtime, whatever, and Amazon Prime. That's one, two, three, four, five, like 60. We're basically paying for all the stations we got before. Maybe not paying for the cable box that it used to come in, but like you would think if you're subscribing to six different services, that when you go to search for the new Linda Ronstadt documentary that you've heard is great, that you wouldn't have to pay for it. But no, there's still like half the content you want to watch isn't available on these platforms. And I don't know. I don't know how you get rid of them. I, I think we're kind of stuck with them if you want to watch all the cool stuff. Some other things, the Parkinson's Foundation. Yeah, I'm a pretty good guy. Made a $100 donation to my, uh, my good friend's daughter in honor of her mom who's suffering from Parkinson's. That's totally well worth it. Walgreens, I bought some mouthwash and dental floss. I had just come from the dentist and I was feeling very dentally active that day. Great Clips, $20 because I care about how I look. Yeah, pretty important. 
Marshalls bought some underwear recently. That was, I like underwear. I'm not into not wearing underwear. Sorry if that changes your your impression of who I am. We spent some money on a vacation out in Arizona at the resort. That was the biggest entry in the entire statement. Not cheap, but very fun. Highly rewarding. Bought some gas at Chevron and Shell. Yeah, I guess gas helps me get where I'm going. So I don't know. I think I feel pretty good about what I'm seeing on here. Not a lot of stuff that I hate. I did see 10 charges to Amazon Marketplace, and I have no idea what any of them are. I, I'm afraid we're just consuming blindly on Amazon, and I'm very much guilty of that as well. All right, so there's some insights into what I've bought and how I feel about it. Do the same for yourself. Let's get back to Mike Norton. Michael I. Norton is the Harold M. Brearley, Brierly, Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School and a member of Harvard's Behavioral Insights Group. He holds a BA in psychology and English from Williams College and a PhD in psychology from Princeton. Shit, this dude is smart, man. Prior to joining HBS, Professor Norton was a fellow at the MIT Media Lab, ditto, and MIT Sloan School of Management. As I mentioned before, he's the co-author with Elizabeth Dunn of the book Happy Money, the Science of Smarter Spending. I hope you enjoy this conversation. I hope it makes you a little bit smarter and a little bit happier. Here's Mike Norton. The third big category, and this is research led by Ashley Willens, who's my colleague at HBS, is anytime you spend money, think about how it's going to affect your time. And if it's not going to affect your time well, do not buy that thing. My name is Paul Ollinger. I'm a stand-up comedian with a background in the corporate world. I hit the lottery when I worked at a small company called Facebook. I'm fascinated with money, why we're so obsessed with it, and how it makes us happy or not. Welcome to Crazy Money. Mike Norton, welcome to Crazy Money. Thanks for having me. So I'm very interested in discussing how to spend money more wisely in ways that will make us happier. But first, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. You have a PhD in psychology, and you're on the faculty of Harvard Business School. What do you study and teach there? I mainly study broadly in the domain of behavioral economics, so thinking about the decisions people make and why we so often seem to go wrong, and then trying to help people and design interventions that can help us be a little bit smarter with our behaviors, mainly focusing on the crazy decisions people make all the time, including me. And then can we design interventions and help people make better decisions, both financially, but also kind of to maximize their well-being. How does that relate to the modern MBA program? You know, it's interesting. So and I've been at HBS for 15 years, and there's been a big change in business over that time toward people wanting to have meaning and purpose in their work and to have positive social impact. In my time at HBS over the last 15 years, there's been a real change among our students, but also in business toward caring more about as an individual having meaning and purpose at work, but also more culturally that your work has positive social impact. Right. And so topics like charitable giving, which, which I work on, which 15, 20 years ago would have been outliers now are often actually central to what people are interested in. How do you create sustainable business practices and things like that? So how does that arrive in the classroom? Like what are the name of the classes that you teach? The last class that I was teaching was called FIELD, which was an acronym, but it's basically a class designed to help people develop emotional intelligence. So we have, you know, it's important as a business leader to understand finance for sure. Mm -hmm. It's also important to understand people for sure as well. And so which one's more important tends to vary over the course of your career, but now it's central to the first year student experience that we're going to try to help folks develop and hone their emotional intelligence as well. A lot of people think an MBA, they use it as a synonymous term for like a greedy business person. Do you feel like there's more emphasis on really understanding what somebody wants from their career today in the modern MBA curriculum, as opposed to just saying, here's how you maximize income and, and wealth. I think that's right. I, I used to do, um, so, so I teach, before I taught this class on emotional intelligence, I taught marketing and I free associate words that came to mind with marketing. And it's things like lying and unethical <laughs> and, and things like that. But then if you, and of course, I mean, like everything in life, sure, some marketers are liars and unethical, but then if you think of people who are trying to market things like better education or people who work at charitable organizations who are trying to fundraise, so you, you can think of many sort of business practices you can think of as being 
bad and uncaring. And of course, sometimes they are, but they're really just tools. So they're, they're tools to do things in the world. And like any tool in the world, you can use it for good or bad, including, for example, money. Mm-hmm. Money isn't good or bad. Money's good or bad, depending on how you deploy it. You study the happiness of millionaires with some other academics out there, and you've co-authored some papers around the happiness of millionaires and time use and happiness of millionaires. What did you learn from those, those efforts? So there's a, a general finding that is true that, and everyone has heard this number, that around $75,000 of annual income, more income doesn't make you that much happier. We discussed that with Angus Deaton a few weeks back. Exactly. And it's very much true. And sometimes that gets interpreted as once you make $75,000, additional income has no impact. And that's not, in fact, what the papers show, including Angus Deaton's work. It shows that it doesn't matter as much after (laughs) $75,000. And what that means is, and I've published papers that say that too, so I'm not criticizing anyone's work. Or if I am, I'm including my own in the criticism. But of course, those surveys never have millionaires in them because millionaires don't fill out surveys. <laughs> they have better things to do. They're millionaires. So we managed to, um, a colleague Paul Smeets, who's at the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands, we managed to survey millionaires and ask them about their happiness. And it turns out that it's true that if you make $10,000 more going from $20,000 to $30,000, that has a bigger impact than going from $75,000 to $85,000. But if it's so many increments of 10,000 that you're making, you know, 750,000, $7.5 million a year, that those little increments start to add up. And it turns out, and I, this is a little bit sad for most of us, millionaires really are happier than the average person. Once you get far enough out that all those little increments of extra happiness add up to real overall happiness. And where do you think that comes from? I mean, is it just having the money itself or is it what that money empowers in your life? Yeah, it seems to be so. We In this research, we looked at time use. And I think the lay theory is that millionaires have extremely different lives than the rest of us in terms of how they spend their time. And they don't really, actually. So they work kind of the same amount. They have the same amount of leisure. They sleep about the same. So they're not like a new breed of human once you become a millionaire. But what we do find is a couple of key differences. One is millionaires, when they engage in leisure, it tends to be more active. So they're exercising and volunteering and socializing. And regular folks, leisure is more watching TV and relaxing. And one reason for that, of course, is that regular people's jobs are more likely to be physically demanding. And so, you know, after you work a 12 hour shift as a nurse, it's a little bit difficult to go home and go for a bike ride. Yeah. If you've been on your feet for 12 hours, you don't want to, you don't feel like hitting the treadmill. The other even bigger one is that millionaires have more control over their time. So when we ask, for example, at work, what percent of the time are you doing things because you want to do them versus because someone told you to do it? Of course, millionaires more often are doing whatever they feel like and regular folks have bosses and they're doing what their boss is telling them to do. And that predicts happiness as well. So it's not that they are have more hours in the day or are different people, but money allows us a little bit more control and discretion. And that's a really big predictor of our well-being in general. And that's partly why millionaires are happier than the rest of us. You dive deeper and you, you look at which millionaires are happiest. And it turns out that not only how much you have, but its source are contributing factors into the happiness of very wealthy people. This is a project with my former student Grant Donnelly, who's now at Ohio State University, in a separate survey of millionaires, we asked people to indicate where the where their millions came from, let's say. Mm-hmm. And at, for most people, it's a mix. And there's all sorts of sources for money. But there's kind of a big breakdown between I made it myself, or I inherited it, or and or got it from my spouse. And we just look to see correlationally, who's happier? Are you happier if you had to earn it? Or are you happier if you inherited it? Regardless of how you got the money, people with more money are a little bit happier. That's fine to <laughs> one. However, within that, it does appear to be the case that people who earned it are happier with their money than people who inherited it. Now, it's not an experiment. So maybe people who earn their money were happier already and went out and, and earned more. So we can't say for sure, because you inherited your money, you're going to be less happy. That's the direction the findings seem to point. 
if you could do research to split those populations in half, what would you want to what would you want to find out? Yeah, I mean, at a very low level, we can do things like in our lab, we can have people either work to get money or give them bonus money. And so at a micro level, we can see what makes people happier. But whatever we would find at that level, it's still not super clear that that would be the same as, you know, inheriting $20 million. Right. So we would love, of course, to randomly assign millionaires, you know, tens of millions of dollars that they either inherited or earned themselves. A little bit difficult to do. The closest we can get is to look at lottery winners who are basically people who bought a chance at a million dollars and most didn't get it, but one person randomly did. So then we can see at least on the, if it just came to you, how does it affect your well-being? That's the closest we can get to sort of a natural experiment on, is it just does receiving money from nowhere really make you happy? The problem there is that people who play the lottery are sort of a different type of person than people who don't. So again, we're limited on saying this applies to everyone versus this applies to the kind of person who who plays the lottery. Have you looked at stock winnings from uh, tech IPOs or things like that? <laughs> it's, it's funny. We were talking about this earlier today with a uh, colleague. We tried to do a survey years ago of tech entrepreneurs, and it turns out that um, even more than millionaires, tech entrepreneurs do not fill out surveys, <laughs> uh, no matter what the incentive is. So we don't. A lot of these questions, actually, which I think are that you're raising that are so fundamental to our understanding of the relationship between money and happiness, mm-hmm. we just don't have the data. The fundamental questions about income and happiness and how they relate to each other, a lot of which you're raising right now, one of the biggest problems is that we just don't have the data. Right. So we don't have data from really wealthy people because they don't feel like filling out surveys. On the other end of the income spectrum, unbanked consumers are difficult to reach. So. Uh-huh not because we're not deeply interested in that question, but because it's harder to find the data to test these questions. Right. Maybe if you offered tech entrepreneurs like a really good hoodie, you know, they would, they would <laughs> yeah. go for, that'd be a good prize for that. Or so, it's a turtleneck worn by Steve Jobs. There you go. The there, ultimate, yeah. Well, yeah. I think that was tried by uh, what's her name who ran uh, the blood company. Anyway. Elizabeth Holmes, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So outside the academic community, you're probably best known as the co-author of the book, Happy Money, The Science of Smarter Spending. And here on Crazy Money, we explore the connection between money and happiness. So I was eager to read your book. Been out for a while, but when I discovered it, I eagerly consumed it. And you found five groups of spending that actually increase people's happiness. You know, I don't know that we need to dive into all of them in depth. Maybe you could give us a quick overview of sort of what you all learned. The ones that are easiest to implement quickly are the ones that I often focus on first. So this was a book co-written with Liz Dunn, who's at the University of British Columbia. Liz is the actual happiness expert. So she (laughs) um, convinced me to write a book on happiness with her. So I actually got to learn a lot that I didn't know about happiness as we wrote. But I think, so the first project that Liz and I did was just a very elegant idea that Liz had, which was... I wonder if we just randomly assign people to spend on other people instead of on themselves, will they be happier or not? Mm -hmm. So we ran lots of studies all over the world in the end showing that the very first thing you can do is if you're thinking of spending on yourself, instead try spending it on somebody else. The second thing you can do, which is also very simple, is it turns out that buying stuff doesn't tend to make us particularly happy. Oh, man. I'm sorry. Everyone is, you can see in the audience, some people that feels validating and other people (laughs) feel deeply disappointed when I say that, Right, right. I think. But but the good news is that experiences do seem to pay off in happiness. So instead of buying another thing, buying an experience and not just a vacation, but an evening out, you know, smaller experiences as well. So that's number two. So just instead of stuff for yourself, try experiences and try someone else. And the third big category, and this is research led by Ashley Willens, who's my colleague at HBS, is anytime you spend money, think about how it's going to affect your time. Mm. And if it's not going to affect your time well, do not buy that thing. So, for example, like a second home, you know, I romanticize about having a place in the mountains because for all sorts of reasons. But on some level, I don't even like owning a first home. So owning a second home is probably not going to lead to more happiness. Exactly. Or, you know, a beautiful, beautiful home. But isn't that, that's the home is definitely beautiful. I I cannot argue that when you're in the home, you won't be happy because you will, but you adding commuting 
cancels out or sometimes even reverses the effect of having an awesome home. So doing the math on, okay, great home, but extra commute. So better thing, worse time. Let me think if those are going to net net bring me to a happier place or a worse off place. Right. And you also have a couple of other ones. One you haven't mentioned yet is called make it a treat. That is create great ways of savoring the experience as opposed to buying as much as you can and consuming it as quickly as you can and pay now, consume later. And all these things you're talking about seem to run counter to the way we live as Americans. Yeah, and a little bit counter, unfortunately, to human nature. So, so I think... Americans are humans, after all. Yeah, we were thinking of... Um, we're the best humans. We're the best humans ever made. <laughs> yeah. We were thinking, actually, of like... Uh, sometimes I always think, uh, when I'm in Cambridge, we have many, many squirrels. And squirrels basically just go around all day and collect acorns and store them. Mm. And the analogy to humans basically accumulating stuff is 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 always very striking to me. So it's absolutely the case that we are built to want to acquire a bunch of stuff, food or stuff. We feel safer and more comfortable when we have stuff. The problem is, and by the way, stuff doesn't make us unhappy for the most part. So typically we don't see people who buy tons of stuff are less happy, mm. which is important. They're just not happier so it isn't a mistake in the sense that, you know, eating 10 pizzas a day is a mistake at some point because you're going to be worse off. Right. It's just that you're not maximizing the happiness you can get. And so we're trying to shift people from a kind of neutral business as usual life to getting a little more happiness by switching to some of these other categories that you mentioned. One of my favorite examples in the book is around scarcity, making it a treat. You say scarcity is the antidote to habituation or getting used to the wonderfulness of something. And you use an example from the McDonald's Corporation. Can you tell me a little bit about the fabulous way they make their treats scarce? Companies do this all the time. In fact, there was just, now I don't remember who it was, Chick-fil-A or Popeye's, but just re-released mm. some chicken sandwich and people were losing their minds because it had been off the market and then back on, <laughs> yes. on the market. Yes. So retailers do this to us all the time where they remove things. McDonald's, it's the McRib, like a map of America <laughs> that has the locations that have the McRib if you want to go on a road trip. Would the McRib be a good sandwich if it were available all the time? Sure. Does making it scarce completely change our psychology Ab <laughs> absolutely and you can see not so much anymore but with iphones they're almost always before the launch used to be some stories about how they weren't sure if they had made enough <laughs> and as right. soon as you hear that you leave for the apple store and get in line and sleep outside in 20 degree weather because if there aren't enough i really need the phone if there's enough eh, whatever i might get it i might not if there's not enough, I got to go right now and get one. <laughs> that's excellent marketing, actually. That's that's brilliant. Yeah, those people are good. How would you put these, if you were to give me advice, you're my personal happiness. And we're talking about short-term happiness. We're not talking about happiness over a lifetime, necessarily. Because if I ate McRibs all the time, I'd be, I'd be a miserable human being. Because at some point, my health would deteriorate. But if you were to give me advice as to how to spend over the next week better, what would you advise me to do? So I would say two things. One is up front, take your credit card statement from last month, print it out and mark it up with, did this thing make me happier or not? And just, you know, you don't have to be spe you know too specific on a 10 point scale, just was this good or bad? Use that as an input into what you do for the following week. So on balance, try to do more of the things when you looked at the expense and you were like, oh, that was great. Versus you looked at the expense and you said, why the hell did I buy 19 coffees you know, a day? Right, right. So it'll, that'll give you some info about yourself. The other very simple thing is, and I fail all the time, by the way, I'm not being judgmental, but I try to anytime I'm reaching for my wallet or about to click, you know, purchase on a website, quick pause. Is this purchase really going to make me any happier? Right. Sometimes the answer is no, but you got to do it because, you know, you're paying your utility bill. So, you know, we're, we're stuck sometimes with, with paying for things that don't make us happy. But sometimes at least just before you click and you stop and say, you know, do I really need that pair of shoes? Sometimes the answer is no. And so first off, not buying that is a good idea. But then to say, maybe I can take that money and give it to someone else or buy an experience or do something else with it. Those little changes, even if you do one a day, we can show at least you'll have a happier day than you would have.
Yeah, you know, you talked about homes before, and we went large after square feet when we moved here to Atlanta. And with square feet comes lots of air conditioning in the south, and paying that utility bill really drives me bananas in the <laughs> yeah, summer. Exactly. It's horrible. So I want to talk to you about your work real quick, and I know we have to wrap up in just a minute, but you know, a lot of the research on happiness says the quality of your social connections is the number one driver of happiness. As I was reading all of your research and everything that you do in your work, you collaborate all the time how does that drive your satisfaction at work and do you ever want all the credit no because then you're culpable <laughs> you can always blame liz dunn if something didn't work out yeah yeah i wasn't my fault it was definitely liz's liz's idea right i think uh you know it's it's um interesting when i was um, talking to some of my current doctoral students the other day even within my email my work is organized by person so, for example, I do research on inequality and I do research on happiness, but my email folders aren't called inequality and happiness. They're called Liz. Mm. And so I think with my work, I'm actually conceiving of it as the person more than the topic. Right. It's not right or wrong. It just showed me how much I think the enterprise is social and collaborative and brainstorming and working together. For me, not for everyone, but for me, it's just much more fun and generative to have someone to kick ideas around with than the classic view of a professor, you know, sitting in your office with Excel, uh, working things out. Now, people who do that make extraordinary discoveries. So I'm not criticizing, but for me, for whatever reason, I love the back and forth. So I can't picture you in a tweed jacket with a pipe <laughs> thinking about these things by yourself in Cambridge. Yeah, to give you, me 10 years. Okay, you just blew my whole conception of you. But uh, one of the things you're collaborating on right now is a podcast called Talking Green with Alison Schrager, the author of An Economist Walks Into a Brothel, and as importantly, a previous guest here on Crazy Money. Tell me a little bit about what you're talking about on Talking Green. So this was an interesting podcast where there was a desire to think about domains of money in life. So there's an episode on family, for example, <laughs> and this idea just that Money can be the greatest thing in our lives. It can solve so many problems and it can also create so, so many problems. And so Talking Green was this idea of, it's not really a podcast about investing, you know, like this is the stock for you. It's a podcast about the psychology of money and how it can lead us to great things and also cause conflict and unhappiness and how we might manage that process a little bit better. What were some of the other areas, the domains that you guys looked into? We did one on money and gender, which was really fascinating about whether men and women are better at money things. And it, as you can imagine, anyone who thinks that men are better is an idiot because that's a ridiculous <laughs> thing to think and the data don't show that. But also how it then creates conflict in couples sometimes when the role of gender in creating conflict around money and what's important. So Talking Green, the podcast is available wherever people get podcasts, I would assume. I think that's right. Will there be a second season? Do we know this yet? We're discussing now. I think that's probable is what I would say, but we'll see. All right, cool. Well, I did listen to a couple episodes of Talking Green. I found it very interesting. And if you're a fan of Crazy Money, I know you'll find it far more interesting with far more intelligent people than the host of this show. <laughs> Where else can people find you on the internet, Professor Norton? Uh, you can go to, this is a very creative website named michaelnorton.com. It took me months to come up with that, but that's where you can find the research papers and things like that. I can't believe the domain was available. I had to uh, murder a couple of people <laughs> to get it, but it, so it took a while. All right, cool. Hey, well, thanks for spending time to us. I appreciate your, uh, your contribution. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you, Mike Norton, for that fun conversation. I appreciate you taking the time to join us, and I appreciate the work you've done and the work in that book specifically. I think the advice to just pause for one second before we pull out the wallet, drive to the mall, or click buy when we're online to think, will this make me happier? Good advice. Slow down. Think about the best ways you can be spending that money. If you enjoyed this conversation with Mike Norton, you might also enjoy the conversation I had with Mike Viking. That's M-E-I-K-W-I-K-I-N-G, who's the author of The Little Book of Huga. He's a Danish guy and writes a lot about how simple acts can make us happier in the way we live our lives, how we spend our time with loved ones, et cetera. And that came out November 5th. So if you want to scroll back in the Crazy Money episode feed, you'll find it there. Another one that might be interesting would be Sir Angus Deaton, 
from uh, September 17th, whose name I mentioned in that interview with Mike just now. He is the co-author of study at Princeton that uh, determined that our happiness peaks around $75,000 in income, or said better, past $75,000 per year in income. There's no additional happiness. There is, of course, additional uh, life evaluation, and that discussion is pretty interesting to consider. That came out on September 17th, Sir Angus Deaton. If you liked Mike Norton, you'll enjoy that conversation as well. We've got some great episodes coming up in the next few weeks, so like I said before, please subscribe or follow this podcast, however it allows you to do so on whichever app you're using to listen to my voice at this moment. would love to stay in touch. If you want to find out more about me, you can go to paulollinger.com or shoot me an email at paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. As always, thank you to my brilliant producer and editor, Mike Carano. Mike, make me sound smart.